Wonders Unit 5, Week 2, Second Day. Our central question, remember this week, is how do shared experiences help people adapt and change? Our genre this week is historical fiction. The story we're going to read is called The Day the Roulettes Got Their Moxie Back. Historical fiction has events and settings that are typical of the time period in which the story takes place. They have characters who act and speak like the dialect of people from that place in the past. So when we are going to explain why this story is historical fiction, make sure you're telling me why it is fiction and why it is historical. Let's read the story. You can either listen to me read or you can go on Connected and read it yourself. The day the roulettes got their moxie back. Read about how a family comes together during a period of great hardship in the United States. Sometimes the thing that gets you through hard times comes like a bolt from the blue. That's what my older brother's letter was like, traveling across the country from a work camp in Wyoming. It was 1937 and Ricky was helping to build facilities for a new state park as part of President Roosevelt's employment program. Though the program created jobs for young men like Ricky, it hadn't helped our dad find work yet. I imagined Ricky looked up at snow-capped mountains and sparkling skies, breathing in the smells of the evergreens as his work crew turned trees into lumber and lumber into buildings. It almost made an 11-year-old weakling like me want to become a lumberjack. Back in our New York City apartment, the air smelled like meatloaf and cabbage. Dad sl sat slantwise in his chair by the window, obviously trying to catch the last rays of sunlight rather than turning on, turn on a light. My older sister Ruth and I lay on the floor comparing the letters Ricky had sent us. Surely Ricky says they had a talent show and he wore a grass skirt and did a hula dance while playing the ukulele. Ruth reported with delight, I'll bet he was the cat's pajamas. It'd be swell to have our own talent show, I replied. Should I start sewing grass skirts? Mom asked from the kitchen, which was just the corner where someone had plopped down a stove next to the sink and an ice box. Now come set the table, dinner's almost ready. Dad stayed where he was, sullen and spent. Any jobs in the paper? Mom asked, her voice rich with sympathy. Dad shook his head. No. He had worked as an artist in the theater for years, but most productions were still strapped for cash. Dad sketched posters in, for shows that did the green light, that did get the green light, just to keep his skills sharp. He even designed posters for Rolette's Follies with Ruth and me depicted in watercolor costumes. For dinner, Mom served a baked loaf of whatever ingredients she had that worked well together. From the reddish color, I could assume that she had snuck in beets. I guarantee you'll like these beets, she said, reading from my frown. It's beet loaf, the meatless meatloaf, she sang as she served up slices. Ruth fidgeted in her seat, still excited about the talent show. Though calm on the outside, inside, I was all a twitter too. Over the next week, Ruth and I practiced our Hawaiian dance routine. Our parents worried about heating bills as cold weather settled in. One Saturday, my father decided to grin and bear it and grab some hot coffee at the local soup kitchen where he hoped to hear about available jobs. Ruth and I begged to go along. Since the kitchen offered donuts and hot chocolate on weekends, he agreed. Most everyone in line was bundled up against the cold. Many of us had to rely on two or three thread bared, bare layers. Like many other men, Dad, Dad bowed his head as if in shame. The line moved slowly. Bored, Ruth began practicing her dance steps. I sang an upbeat tune to give her some music. Around us, downturned hats lifted to reveal frowns becoming smiles. Soon, folks began clapping along. Egged on by the supportive response, Ruth twirled and swayed like there was no tomorrow. Those girls sure have moxie, someone shouted. They've got heart, all right, offered another. Why, they ought to be in pictures. With performances like that, I'd nominate them for an Academy Award, a woman called out. Those are my girls, Dad declared, his head held high. 
everyone burst into applause for those short moments the past didn't matter and the future blossomed ahead of us like a beautiful flower. I couldn't wait to write Ricky and tell him the news. So as you can see in this story, there are some hardships going on that people had to deal with. Just like we are now, a lot of people are out of work and things are getting difficult for people as we have to stay home. So this is historical fiction because you can see it was set in 1937, but it is something that could really happen, although we're not sure if this really did happen, so that's why it is fiction. But all of these things could happen and it happened back in 1937. Our first comprehension strategy is to make predictions. As you read, you should be making predictions so that you can tell what's going on. We can see from the title um, that how the day the Rolettes got their moxie back that the main characters in the story will be the Rolettes. Um, we might not know what the word moxie means, but the story will probably have some positive endings since the roulettes will get something that they have been missing. So that's usually a way to say that it's going to end in a positive way. The main comprehension strategy is compare and contrast. Let's take a commercial break and watch a short video. Go ahead, pump five, pay when you're done. Surprise! It's time to play Name That Text Structure! We're the only game show that shows up wherever you are and asks you to name that text structure. Oh, yeah! All right, ma'am, are you ready for your passage? Are you serious? Both discus and shot put are Olympic track and field events. They both require great strength and skill. The throwing motions and objects are very different, however. In discus, the thrower spins quickly and slings a disc. Shot putters will glide and hop into their throws and they throw a heavy metal ball. Okay, ma'am. Now, can you name that text structure? Um, is it compare and contrast? Why do you think it's compare and contrast? Compare and contrast usually tells us what's the same and what's different about a subject. So here, we learn how discus and shot put are both Olympic events. Uh-huh, yes, go on but also how they throw very different objects and use different throwing styles. The passage even uses the word different. Pump five, is that man bothering you? Compare and contrast is absolutely correct. You've done it. You've named that text structure. Oh yeah. What do you have to say? This is fantastic. Does this mean my tank of gas is free? Free gas? What are you talking about? My prize. What's my prize for winning the game? Oh, um, go, 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 run away, run away. So let's compare and contrast our characters. We had mom, dad, Ruth, and Shirley. And if you take a look at dinner at the Roulettes, mom is singing. She's trying to make the best of things. Dad is sullen, which means very sad. He shakes his head and he's very tired. Ruth is excited. She's fidgeting. She's dreaming about a show. Shirley is quiet but she is excited and she's dreaming of the show. Remember, the show is the talent show. So we can see how everybody is dealing with the situation in their different ways by comparing and contrasting them. Our vocabulary strategy are idioms. An idiom is an expression that cannot be defined by the words in it. Some common idioms that we might hear are raining cats and dogs or have a th frog in your throat or it's a piece of cake. So um, in our story, we have some idioms, the cat's pajama, get the green light, grin and bear it, like there was no tomorrow. And the very first idiom that we have is a bolt from the blue. So when we think about a bolt, we think about lightning and how quickly and unpredictable it can strike. So letters like this came out of nowhere. So that's what this idiom it is. So I'm going to pause for a short video on idioms. We speak students. Idioms a la shmup. You may have been asking yourself, when will I finally outgrow the need for shmup? Uh, the answer, when the cows come home. On a bunch of flying pigs. Yeah, we said that. An idiom like a lifetime of painless homework is a whole load of nonsense. It's never going to actually happen. An idiom is a phrase that means something completely different from how it sounds. If idioms were taken literally, well, we'd all be very confused and disappointed. 
Idioms are kind of like slang in that they usually have some historical origin. So maybe one time someone said this phrase and in that precise instance it made some sense so more people started saying it and now it makes zero sense and sounds sort of weird but we still say it. Anyway, so if somebody says something that seems totally dumb they might actually have an excuse. They might just be using an idiom like one of these common ones. A piece of cake is something that's really easy to do. Like, eat a piece of cake, and another, and another, even when we sort of feel like puking, uh, bring it on. Letting the cat out of the bag is when someone spills a really big secret, which really sounds a little more dramatic than a cat that's in the bag. Uh, a cat in a bag just sounds like a great YouTube video. There's also the elephant in the room, as in that huge thing that everybody's thinking but nobody's saying, like that awkward Thanksgiving dinner when everyone knew Aunt Judy and Uncle Bob were getting a divorce. Biting off more than you can chew is getting a little overexcited and committing to too many things and ending up crying at 4 a.m. doing a group project all alone. Oh, and still having brand practice in three hours. To kick the bucket means to die. So maybe the bucket was filled with scalding acid or something. Yeah, that'd be bad. Keeping an eye on somebody. Hmm, well, that's just watching over them. Maybe they're an unruly child or a shifty poker player. No eyeball removal necessary, although that would definitely keep anyone from trying anything fishy. And plenty of fish in the sea is what we tell our friends when they go through a nasty uh, romantic dumping. There are plenty of other eligible bachelors or bachelorettes uh, without literal fins. And there's plenty more where that came from. Break a leg, hit the books, miss the boat, on the fence, pulling wool over someone's eyes, and the list goes on. Uh, we suggest warning people before you invent any new ones. <laughs> Send them to us anyway, and we'll uh, shmup them for you. Subscribe to check out more equally fantabulous videos. You should see the subscribe button just below this one. If you're having trouble locating it, we recommend you watch our video, How to Find the Subscribe Button. Now that we've read our story on for the week, the beginning story of the week, I want you to go ahead and take the quiz. You can go practice idioms and practice um, the other strategies in our Connect Ed program if you want to do that before the test.